So this is the management of savagery, the most critical stage through which the Ummah will pass by Abu Bakr Naji, translated by William McCants. Um, and funding for this translation is provided by John of the Harvard University, so it's not a it's not gonna be a shit translation either. Which is nice. So what we're probably gonna look at here because this is actually fairly long, it's about 200 pages. Um, we're probably going to go through the preface, um, the order that has governed the world since the sykes picot era, the illusion of power, the centrality of the superpowers is a function of their overwhelming military power and deceptive media halo. Um, and then we're going to go through the three topics. So, first topic, definition of the management of savagery and an overview of its historical precedents. The second topic, the path for establishing an Islamic state. That's interesting. And then third topic, the most important principles and policies for implementing the plan of action and achieving in general the goals of the stage of, quote, the power of vexation and exhaustion, unquote. And in particular, the goals of the stage of the management of savagery, by the permission of God, apparently. So we'll probably close off at about page uh, 25, I'm guessing. We'll see how far we get, because now we're just, th this whole section here just goes long. Right. Um, so we'll probably end off at the, the uh, third topic, but then it continues down here. Fourth topic, the most important uh, problems and obstacles that we will face and ways of dealing with them. Um, the problem of the lack of administrative cadres. There's a lot here that's really interesting. Just topically. I don't know if the actual continents will be interesting. Um, probably, because this isn't really a vanity project, the Green Book by Gaddafi was painful because it really had no practical value. Buckle in. And remember, if you appreciate what I do, super chat the stream. And if you want to feed the theory meter or the jelly meter, specify in your super chat which one you'd like to support. And when that hits $100, you will have purchased for yourself a minimum hour's coverage of the section of your choice. As you can see in the... Uh, the poll to your right over here. Um, and if you uh, donate $100 in one super chat, you just get to pick whatever, which is why we're doing this. All right, without further ado, the pollen is absolutely eating me alive, so let's do this while I still can. <clears throat> Introduction. Praise be to God and peace uh, and peace and blessings be upon the messenger of God, his family, his companions, and whomever aided him. In a previous essay, I wrote about the substantive preparations undertaken by that group of Islamic activists whom I consider to be carrying out the command of God in this age, that group which, with God's permission, will be granted victory. The essay touched on the program that the group advocates for extricating the Ummah from the degradation that afflicts it, so that the Ummah may once again steer humanity toward the path of divine guidance and salvation. Um, the Ummah, for those who are unfamiliar, refers to the Muslim community um, taken as a whole. Now, who that actually includes is going to differ widely depending on which sect you're reading, but I digress. The essay compared this program with the programs that have been advocated by other groups of Islamic activists and that have confused the Islamic youth. Yes, many of the youth chose this or that path on the base of compatibility with their work, whims, and recreational activities. However, some have been confused by the multiplicity of plans for the solution of a matter which, at the very least, the authoritative Islamic texts have already decided in the eyes of the well-known people. Among the things pertaining to the subject referred to above is briefly, and Naji begins a long quote from an article he had previously written, quote, of all the currents of the Islamic movement, only five of them have written programs. After setting aside the current of propagation and proselytizing, the current of the Salafism of purification and education, the, uh, okay, this, this is not particularly useful to us. We're actually going to jump ahead of this, and we're going to go straight to, God, that was a long quote. We're going to go straight to the preface. Editor, just cut that out. That was a waste of time. Preface, the order that has governed the world since the sykes picot era. Contemplating the previous centuries, even until the middle of the 20th century, one finds that when the large states or empires collapse, and even small states, whether they were Islamic or non-Islamic, 
and a state did not come into being that was comparable in power and equivalent to the previous state with regard to control over the lands and regions of that state which had collapsed, the regions and sectors of the state changed through human nature on account of submission to what is called the administrations of savagery. However, the situation stabilized soon after that on account of the order uh, the Sykes-Picot Treaty established. Thereupon, the division of the Caliphal State and the withdrawal of the colonial states was such that the Caliphal State was divided into large states and small states, ruled by military governments or civil governments supported by military forces. The ability of these governments to continue administrating these states was, con was consonant with the strength of their connection with these military forces and the ability of these forces to protect the form of the state, whether through the power which these forces derived from their police or army or through the external power which supported them. Here we will not deal with how these states were maintained or how these governments exercised control, regardless of whether uh, we believe that they obtained control by virtue of their victory over the governments of colonialism or by virtue of working secretly with colonial rule and being assigned its place when it withdrew, or a mixture of the two, these states, in short, fell into the hands of these governments because one or both of these reasons. Whether these countries were truly independent, or each secretly succeeded the state that colonized it previously, they began after a time to circle in the orbit of the global order which resulted after the end of the Second World War. The outer form of this global order was the body of the United Nations, and its inner reality was two superpowers, literally poles, that consisted of two states joined by rival camps of the allied powerful states. Moreover, each superpower was followed by dozens of satellite states. A regime controlling a satellite state that encircles it in the orbit of one of the superpowers, acquiring economic and military benefits from it, is compensated by that superpower which, uh, with various types of support. However, in accordance with the nature of the inhabitants of our countries, which these regimes rule, in other words, like the countries whose inhabitants are Muslims, this support was largely limited, and most of it went to supporting individuals in the ruling regimes or personal support for the military commanders of these states and the influential leaders of their armies. Following that period, some of the regimes collapsed and others were established, either because the superpower abandoned it or was unable to protect it from collapsing, or because another superpower helped a different group infiltrate this regime, overthrow it, and take its place by seizing it in accordance with pure universal law. Those regimes that achieved stability were able to impose their values upon the society of every state they controlled. If they circled in the orbit of a new superpower or still flirted with the superpower that supported the previous regime, they mixed their social and economic values with the values of the superpower in whose orbit they circled and imposed the mixture upon society, placing a sacred halo around these values, even if they were values that every rational mind refused. These regimes opposed the belief system of the societies which they ruled, and with the passage of time and gradual decay, they squandered and plundered the resources of those states and spread iniquity among the people. In accordance with pure universal law, we find that the powers that can once again enable the values and the belief system of society to govern the state, or not even for the sake of the belief system and truth, but for the sake of rejecting iniquities and upholding the justice with which the believing majority agrees, are two types. The first, the power of the masses. This power was tamed and its self-awareness was dissipated through thousands of diversions, whether through the desires of the sexual organs and the stomach, or, pant or, paint or, or panting, pardon, to reach the summit of livelihood or accumulate of wealth, to say nothing of the deceptive media halos in various directions, and the spread of the predestinationist Sufi and Mergeite, actually we haven't heard that word before, Mergeite, uh, thought throughout the sectors of society. From time to time, there is a defanging of some of the masses who wake up from heedlessness by means of the armies and police of these states, which consider this duty to be their fundamental task, for which they accumulate wealth. This endeavor protects these regimes, or protects the circuit of the ruling regime in the orbit of one of the two superpowers. The second, uh, the second power that can return society to justice and to its belief system and values, even if it is partially according to the Sunna, is the power of armies. The states lavish plundered money upon them and buy them off so that they do not perform this function, but rather the opposite. So he's basically just talking about like popular revolution versus a, a military junta. Despite the violence of Satan, a small group of thinkers and noble people remain who oppose tyranny and seek justice. This group wants to use the power they possess to change this reality for the better in accordance with their belief system. 
However, a second consideration that occurs to them is the existence of a criminal force in these armies which does not pay heed to values and is able to summon the powerful Captain Pollution to counter Captain Planet. Even if in the best of circumstances there is a clear plan for uniting, uh, uh, literally encircling, the disharmonious elements of the military power, one or both of the superpowers will, under the cover of the United Nations, compel the new regime through trickery, force, pressure, or all of these, to continue circling in the orbit of one of the superpowers, and they will force new beneficiaries upon the new regime. This honored person who came to power comes to resemble those who went before him, like al-Bashir in Sudan. Also the name of a famous doctor. Uh, two, this is... Also, it was planned in another form for Afghanistan during the rule of the Taliban before the events of September. In that case, the plan was to exhaust it with long sanctions and press a button at the appropriate moment to transfer money and arms to the opposition and support them with people from neighboring countries, annihilating that state. That's the least one could expect. Thus, the possibility of direct intervention under, pre under any pretext is also proven. This is a, this is a weird essay. This is a weird... Weird essay. For the most part, those who think about these noble people end up turning away from the idea of changing those regimes, accepting the status quo, and turning within uh, themselves, carrying bitterness in their hearts. Those among them that are honest with their weak souls resign from their military work, otherwise it does not take them long to sink into the quagmire, giggity of darkness and decadence beneath the slogan of no religion and no world or no goodness, no justice and no world. Such is the state of affairs since the fall of the Caliphate. There's not a lot to comment on here, it's... it's... rambling. The illusion of power. The centrality of the superpowers is a function of their overwhelming military power and deceptive media halo. The two superpowers which used to dominate the global order controlled it through their centralized power. That's a weird sentence. They controlled it through their centralized power. The meaning of centralized power here is uh, the overwhelming military power which extends from the center in order to control the areas of land that submit to each superpower, beginning from the center and reaching the utmost extremity of these lands. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to picture what he means by this. Does he mean the capacity to project military power? Because that's not actually, that's not a continuous thing, right? Like, are we talking about the legal right to project military power? Like, are we talking about, like, the the uh, borders within which a state can just de deploy military forces without having to ask somebody else's permission? Are we talking... Because, like, if, if he means this literally, like, the overwhelming military power, which extends, literally extends from the center in order to control the areas of land to submit to superpower at the utmost extremity of these lands... Is he talking about, like, an ongoing permanent presence? Because that's certainly not present in an overwhelming uh, quantity in any situation. Uh, submission in its primary, simplest form means that these lands owe the center loyalty, submission to its judgment, and responsibility for its interests. These, man these lands owe the center responsibility for its interests? There is no, like, that's even, that's even opposite most, like, imperial logic, which is the, the reason to remain subservient is precisely because the empire serves the interests of the periphery. That would be the justification. There is no doubt the power which God gave to the two superpowers, America and Russia. Yes, we're talking about America and Russia, so overwhelming military power which extends from the center in order to control the areas of land to submit to each superpower, beginning from the center and reaching the utmost extremity of these lands. This makes no sense. He thinks of power as like a puddle, right? Like you just, it, you pour it on a map and just wherever the puddle extends, it's where it is. It's not like potentiality. It's not like, it's not, it's not optical. It's not like the, the, I guess, I guess this section is called the illusion of power. So maybe he'll break this down. Anyways, so God gave uh, power to America and Russia, apparently. Overwhelming in the estimation of humans. However, in reality, and after careful reflection, using pure human reason, one comes to understand that this power is not able to impose its authority from the, from the country of the center, from America, for example, or Russia, upon lands in Egypt and Yemen, for example, unless these latter countries submit to those powers entirely of their own accord. It is correct that this power is overwhelming and that it seeks help from the power of local regimes controlled by proxies. 
who rule the Islamic world, yet all of that is not enough to completely control the satellite states. Therefore, the two superpowers must resort to using a deceptive media halo, which portrays these powers as non-coercive and world-encompassing, able to reach into every earth and heaven as if they possess the power of the creator of creation. I don't know, dude. When was this published? 2004? Like, when I think of, um... When I think of America's behavior in the early 2000s in the Middle East, I don't... I don't think of, uh, I don't, I don't think of an image carefully cultivated of being non-coercive. This must be a very shaky translation. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Like it's possible. It's just a bad translation, but like it, it seems internally coherent. It just doesn't seem to be like very sophisticated. It's hard to tell with these things. But the interesting thing that happened is that these two superpowers believed for a time their media deception. That they are actually a power capable of completely controlling any place in the entire world. And that this power bears the characteristics of the power of the creator. According to the media deception, it is an all-encompassing, overwhelming power. And people are subservient to it, uh, not only through fear, but also through love. Because it spreads freedom, justice, equality among humanity, and various other slogans. When a state submits, whatever the extent of its ability, to the illusion of the deceptive power and behaves on this basis, that is when its downfall begins. It is just as the American author Paul Kennedy... Oh, God. I'm, I'm, it's starting to make sense now. Is anyone familiar with Paul Kennedy? He's the uh, Parliament of Man guy, right? He's a British foreign policy guy. Anyways, as Paul Kennedy says, if America expands the use of its military power and strategically extends more than necessary, this will lead to its downfall. This overwhelming power is also assisted by the cohesion of the society in the central country and the cohesion of that society's institutions and sectors. The overwhelming military power, its weapons, technology, and fighters, has no value without the cohesion of society and the cohesion of society's institutions and sectors. But this overwhelming military power may become a curse to this great superpower if the cohesion of society collapses. Several elements that cause the collapse of this entity are summarized in the statement, quote, elements of cultural and civilizational annihilation, quote, such as the corruption of religion, moral collapse, social iniquities, opulence, selfishness, giving priority to worldly pleasures, the love of the world over all values, etc., Whenever a large mixture of these elements are combined within the superpower and those elements mix in such a way that they energize each other, that superpower's speed of collapse increases. Whether these elements are actively present or latent, they need an assisting element to activate them and cause the downfall of that superpower and its centralization of power, no matter how much military power it possesses. As we have said, this is because the power of its centralization embodied by the overwhelming military power and the deceptive media halo can only be in a cohesive society. This is transparently untrue. Um, and you need only look to the fact that, for example, Russia deploys mercenary armies to some effect. Um, but leaving that aside, this seems to be like a very, um, so Machiavelli is, Machiavelli has this, um, sort of medical approach to, um, understanding, I guess, social stability. Uh, he basically, uh, he, he imagines it in the form of like medieval, like humors. So you have like different like fluids in your body that you need to kind of balance out. They need to be in sort of a harmonious relationship with each other. One not in excess, etc. This is the basis of like, um, when they used to treat people with, with leeches, it would be because they thought there was, I, I think it was because there was literally too much blood in the body. Um, something similar is kind of going on here. Um, the idea is a, 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 a state power is like an organism and it needs to maintain its health in order to be able to project its power at, at distance. Um, and if you have social degradation or degeneration of some kind, whether this is moral or otherwise, then the parts stop working together and eventually the whole thing just, fortunately states are not actually organisms. Um, not in that sense. And they don't actually require the health of its people on a moral level, on any number of levels, actually, in order to be able to project uh, power abroad at all. They, they, that's not really a condition of it. Now, I mean, 
it, to a certain extent, like a certain amount of lack of cohesion can can obviously be burdensome by itself, and that can like severely tax a state. But um, sort of this kind of like cultural or civilizational health or whatever you want to call it, um, like this this notion of like moral collapse, social iniquities, and opulence. The idea that these necessarily lead to the collapse of states is not true. There's no reason to think that. Like certainly they they make their they stand as reasons for why people within a state would hate their state. But um not even really hating your country is typically enough to actually drive people to um undermine it. I mean case in point, like when we're talking about the overwhelming military power, right? Because he talks about two ways in which uh in which an evil state can be righted from within. It's either by the people, like in the case of a popular revolution, or in the case of a military takeover. But the military can be paid off. The military can also simply assume the role of a government once it takes over that's as corrupt. And this has happened many times in the past. Um, and as he notes here, people can be paid off as well. And people, like, it's just, it's just this isn't, this isn't very sharp. Weirdly, I was kind of hoping it'd be a bit more interesting. What if this assisting element is the decree of God, which he ordained in order to act upon these three axes? It would not only work to activate the latent elements of cultural annihilation, but confront the military power with exhaustion. This confrontation and exhaustion directly affects the third axis, axis which is the deceptive media halo. It removes the aura of invincibility which this power projects, that nothing at all stands in front of it. This is exactly what happened to the communist superpower when it was put in a military confrontation with a power weaker than itself by several degrees. It was not even comparable. However, the weaker power succeeded in exhausting it militarily. He's talking about Afghanistan. And even more important, it, it activated the elements of cultural annihilation in the superpower's homeland. The dogma of atheism versus belief systems that believe in the next life and a god. Love of the world, worldly pleasure, and opulence versus individuals who had nothing to lose. Robin Page, thank you for the $5. This is both a massive oversimplification of geopolitics and hopelessly naive about how power and personal ambition works in the developing world. That's that's uh, that's the read I'm getting from this primarily. It's, it's very naive. Very naive. Um, it's like um, it's like something a, a, a second-year poli-sci student would write. Moral corruption, the least manifestation of which was that Russian soldiers or officers returned home if they returned and found their wives had a child or relationship with someone else. I mean, look, if um, if the state of veterans was a, was a serious material detriment to the effectiveness of the American military, then they wouldn't be left to uh, left to rot from mental illness and drug addiction when they came back. Social iniquities clearly floated to the surface when the economic situation weakened because of the war. Then, when money becomes scarce and monetary crises begin, the major thieves appear, especially if accurate accounting begins. I don't know what that means. Additionally, note that the economic weakness resulting from the burdens of war are from aiming blows of vexation directly toward blows of vexation. Aiming blows of vexation directly toward the economy is the most important element of cultural annihilation since it threatens the opulence and worldly pleasures which those societies thirst for. Then competition for these things begins after they grow scarce due to the weakness of the economy. Likewise, social iniquities rise to the surface on account of the economic stagnation, which ignites political opposition and disunity among the various sectors of society. Or, uh, literally, social entity. Various sectors of... Social entity in a general sense. This is, this is a weird word to translate, apparently. Uh... In the central country. Likewise, his power, despite its weakness, uh, acted upon the third axis by removing the respect for the Russian army from the hearts of the masses whose regimes used to revolve in the Soviet orbit in Europe and Asia. Thus, one after another, they began to fall away and desert it. Yeah, that's not what happened. Oh, boy. However, this weak force acted upon a special fourth axis in the Ummah. It is the reviving of dogma and jihad in the hearts of the Muslim masses who had submitted to the social entity of the superpower when they saw the example and model of these poor Afghani people, their neighbors in jihad. 
They were able to remain steadfast in the face of the strongest military arsenal and the most vicious army in the world with respect to the nature of its members at the time. Granted, with the direct backing of the the actually more powerful, uh, most powerful arsenal in the world. Um, thus, we saw that the Jihad brought forth many Muslims from unknown lands like Chechnya and Tajikistan. Everything we have recorded here is already reality. But, of course it is. You were giving a... That, that was a historical account. It was wrong, but it's a historical account. But the most important point is that it is easier for the people of knowledge and insight to understand how the process works as a result of the bounty of God upon whomever boldly plunges into battle. For example, the martyr, and we consider him as such, Sayyid Kutba, as the author of Milestones, discussed the fall of the Soviet Union and explicated the laws which would, for the most part, lead to it, but he was not able to fix the time of its occurrence or give specific details. In contrast, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Azam, who was martyred for the fall of the Soviet Union, had an analysis which predicted the fall of the superpower and the division of its republics and the emergence of Islamic movements that would oppose some of its republics. I mean, like crazy and anti-Soviet guerrilla fighters have theories that the Soviet Union can lose. Surprise. Even more remarkable than this is that his analysis was built on numbers such that he calculated the number of the forces of the Russian army, which possessed the greatest arsenal of weapons in the world, and an army greater than the American army with respect to size, viciousness, and the ability to endure the atmosphere of battles and its human losses. Even more remarkable. <laughs> is that his analysis did not depend on the withdrawal of the Russian army from Afghanistan, even though he had hoped for that. Rather, it depended on the idea that pressure from the Muhajids would push Russia would push Russia to pump larger numbers of troops into Afghanistan, which would reduce the reserves of the Soviet army, and that this pressure and reduction would encourage the Soviet republics to try to secede, especially the Islamic republics whose inhabitants saw it as a workable model for the possibility of resistance. Okay, that's accurate. Almost everything he said happened as if it were a cinematic film. From this, we, uh, from this we know that understanding the abilities of the enemy and the time of his defeat only comes to us by plunging into active war with him, regardless of whether we have a rational mind or theoretical research at hand. So, put that in your pipe and smoke it, Sunsa. Here we note that the superpowers republics fell into chaos when it collapsed, but because specific elements quickly came into existence, administrations of states were established and most of them without passing through the stage of the administration of savagery, some of which have succeeded in attaining stability until the present time. In Chechnya and Afghanistan, Afghanistan was not one of the Soviet republics, the administrations of savagery uh, succeeded in establishing what can be called states, but they have collapsed now. They have returned to a stage before the administration of savagery, which is the stage of the power of vexation and exhaustion. We also note that the course of events in the two countries is not due to the events in Dagestan or the momentous events of September 11th, even if they perhaps hastened it. A detailed explanation of this would take a long time, and we have previously f referred to that which concerns Afghanistan. Is it going to make it easy for me to find the footnote? Yes, it will. Good. What the hell was that? Oh, I see. It's, it is a footnote. It's not a note. Details concerning these stages will come later by the permission of God. <laughs> uh, this was a uh, citation. Uh, this occurred to me in a vision by the angel Gabriel. So that superpower collapsed, but the civilization of Satan was able to quickly rectify the matter and stabilize control in the world through the cohesion of the remaining power, America, for it carries out the role which the two superpowers had played together with, in general, the states of the world, and in particular, those of our region. But the picture became even bleaker in the eyes of some of the noble people, whether they were religious or otherwise, in the states submitting to this global order. According to them... They doubt that the remaining superpower can be annihilated and that the components of its power differ in kind from the collapsed superpower, especially since its media halo is much stronger than the media halo of the collapsed superpower. Uh, 
okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. We've gone through like twenty pages of this, and he's saying a whole lot of nothing. Why do we call? Okay, here we go. Oh, we're actually just getting to the. Okay, I'll just I'll just continue because we're we're about there anyways. Some others among the people of truthfulness and jihad used to set forth what God had showed them, and the notion was established in their minds that the enemy was weak and insignificant. If God decreed something, it could be done. This group says to the remainder of the people of religion and to the masses, O oh people, the viciousness of the Russian soldier is double that of the American soldier. If the number of Americans killed is one-tenth of the number of Russians killed in Afghanistan and Chechnya, they will flee, heedless of all else. This is because the current structure of the American and Western military is not the same as the structure of their military in the era of colonialism. They reached a stage of effeminacy, which made them unable to sustain, to sustain battles for a long period of time. That one didn't age too well. And they compensate for this with a deceptive media halo. O oh, people, the center in the Soviet Union was to a certain extent close to the countries in which there was opposition to it. They even shared borders with areas that opposed it, so supplies... Motorized units and armored vehicles used to pour in with ease under that much cost. The matter is different with regard to America. The remoteness of the primary center from the peripheries should help the Americans understand the difficulty of our continued submission to them. Their control over us and their pillaging of our resources if we decide to refuse, but only if we refuse and inflame opposition to its materialization. Yeah, that's, that's not what happens, actually. It's kind of the opposite. The uh, the buffering kind of means that there uh, any any notion of American fragility is 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 long dulled by the time it reaches the ears of the average American, if indeed it ever does. This was the picture until the momentous events of September and its four tokens, which appeared with the momentous events of Nairobi and Dar el Salaam. Jesus. In summary, the contemporary renewal movement was purified after momentous events and battle severely damaged it, and it accumulated experience during more than 30 years. It must now undertake some of the specific operations arranged systematically, and carry out what began with the operation of Nairobi and Dar al Salam for the achievement of the following goals by the grace of God. The first goal, destroy a large part of the respect for America and spread confidence in the souls of Muslims by means of one, reveal the deceptive media to be a power without force, That must be an odd translation. The deceptive media to be a power without force. I assume this means um, just to to rob the deceptive media of its force. Two, force America to abandon its war against Islam by proxy and force it to attack directly so that the noble ones among the masses and a few of the noble ones among the armies of apostasy will see that their fear of deposing the regimes because America is their protector is misplaced in that when they depose the regimes, they are capable of opposing America if it interferes. It's war against Islam by proxy. The second goal, replace the human casualty sustained by the renewal movement during the past 30 years by means of the human aid that will probably come for two reasons. One, being dazzled by the operations which will be undertaken in opposition to America, and two, anger over the obvious direct American interference in the Islamic world, such that anger compounds the previous anger against America's support for the Zionist entity. <clears throat> it also transforms the suppressed anger toward the regimes of apostasy and tyranny into a positive anger. Human aid for the renewal movement will not dry up, especially when heedless people among the masses, and they are the majority, discover the truth of the collaboration of these regimes with the enemies of the Ummah to such an extent that no deceptive veil will be of use and no pretext will remain for any claimant to the Islam of these regimes and their like. That is massively ahistorical. Um, in fact, despite the fact that there is a, in fact, there's actually like widespread popular um, disdain for American and, and other Western interference in the Middle East, as well as for support for Israel. But um, most uh, Middle Eastern states have zero interest or capacity to do anything about that. And they have their own economic self-interest um, and their leaders have their own economic self-interest. And so despite there being very widespread, very widespread spite and rage towards the Israeli state, um, these states themselves uh, don't actually pose any real threat to it currently, or certainly aren't attempting to pose a threat. This is coming right after 9-11. This, um, this is published in 2004. Yeah, this was published online in 2004. It is... Um, 
It is very bad so far. Here, there's an article about it here in The Guardian. And the third goal. Uh... Work to expose the weakness of America's centralized power by pushing it to abandon the media psychological war and the war by proxy until it fights directly. As a result, the apostates among all of the sects and groups... This is like apocalyptic logic, where it's like, oh, they're, they're, they hate their way of life, so just push them to attack Islam directly? I, I don't know what it's supposed to be saying here. As a result, the apostates among all of the sects and groups, and even Americans themselves, will see the remoteness of the primary center from the peripheries as a major factor contributing to the possible outbreak of chaos and savagery. I'm going to take a quick break from this. We're going to actually look at um, an article here. So this, this is an article from um, 2015, actually, by uh, Hassan Hassan. ISIS has reached new depths of depravity, but there's a brutal logic behind it. Um, the video showing the burning alive of the captive Jordanian pilot Maud al Kassaspa uh, prompted a revulsion around the world. Here, the author of an acclaimed new book on the rise of ISIS examines the ideology that is driving the jihadi movement to even more brutal killings. So in the Middle East, the savagery of the murder has raised the question, why is ISIS so cruel? The question was first raised during the early weeks of ISIS's takeover of swaths of Iraq and Syria in June, an event accompanied by mass slaughter and the enslavement and abuse of thousands of women. Since then, especially after the airstrikes began in the two countries, the debate has largely petered out. Savagery is a part of ISIS's ideological DNA. The danger of the group lies in its effort to transform the concept of jihad not through individual fatwas, as al-Qaeda does to justify suicide bombing in civilian areas, but through a fully-fledged ideology. To do so, ISIS uses stories from Islamic history and modern jihadi texts to change the paradigm of how to understand and conduct jihad. <clears throat> One of the most prominent of those jihadi texts is a book called Idaret al Tawahush, or Management of Savagery, by an anonymous jihadi ideologue who calls himself Abu Bakr Naji. I don't think he's that anonymous. I think he's dead now. I think they confirmed his killing. Um, because he, uh, I thought he was. Yeah, he died in 2008. Um, he was uh, killed in a U.S. airstrike in Pakistan. Um, uh, the book, translated by William McCants of the U.S. Brookings Institution in 2006, has been widely distributed on jihadist online forums, but for the first time, ISIS members have confirmed that the book is part of the organization's curriculum. As part of research for a book I co-wrote, one ISIS-affiliated cleric said that Naju's book is widely read among provisional commanders and some rank-and-file fighters as a way to justify beheadings is not only religiously permissible, but recommended by God and Muhammad. That's interesting, because I was reading, um, I was reading this, the, uh, Wikipedia page on Abu Bakr, uh, Naji earlier, and, uh, he has, uh, he has later writings. Um... al -Hakim authored several books and short pamphlets on the topic of jihad, um... So in an essay entitled uh, Towards a New Strategy and Resisting the Occupier, published in 2006, so two years after the one that we've been looking at here, um, Al-Hakim stresses the need to consider public opinion in planning operations, discouraging beheadings, or operations that can cause larger-scale casualties to innocent Muslims. Okay, so that's interesting. So his identity actually hasn't been established. Um, so they're kind of assuming... So, Muhammad Hassan Khalil al-Hakim, he is known, and he's dead. But it seems to be the uh, Al-Arabiya Institute for Studies. It seems to be an assumption by this organization that al-Hakim is the author of the management of savagery. Is there confirmation of this? That's in Arabic, I can't read that. Here, I'm just going to close this so I see where it's taking me first. So this just seems to assert that Abu Bakr Naji is uh, Al-Hakim. Not a lot in the way of confirmation here. I guess it's unknown. But we'll continue with this. Naji's book is read widely by uh, among provisional commanders and some rank-and-file fighters as a way to justify beheadings. The management of savagery's greatest contra uh, contribution lies in its differentiation between the meaning of jihad and other religious te uh, tenets. The author argues that the way jihad is taught on paper, quote-unquote, makes it harder for young Mujahideen and Muslims to grasp the true meaning of the concept. That would be the introduction that we skipped, I think. 
One who previously engaged in jihad knows that it is not but violence, crudeness, terrorism, deterrence, and massacring Nazi rights. As translated by McCant, I am talking about jihad and fighting, not about Islam, and one should not confuse them. He cannot continue to fight and move from one stage to another unless the beginning state contains a stage of massacring the enemy and deterring him. The concept ISIS uses to justify the massacre of hundreds of uh, Shaitat tribesmen in Deir Azor, Syria, in August was Tashrid, a word that can be translated as deterrence, as mentioned in the quoted text. Quote, that is the true jihad, said Abu Musa, an ISIS-affiliated religious cleric, echoing Naji's text. The layman who learned some of his religion from mainstream clerics think of jihad as a fanciful act conducted far away from him. In reality, jihad is a heavy responsibility and requires toughness, unquote. Um, Naji's book offers practical tips on how to fill the power vacuum left by what he calls the retreating armies of the West and its regional agent regimes as a result of gradual violence applied by the Mujahideen. He says the defeat of the Crusaders in the past was not a result of decisive battles between the Muslim and Christian armies, but was a process of exhaustion and depletion. He argues that the Muslim army in the 12th century Battle of Hatton, when Crusaders led by the King of Jerusalem, Guy of uh, Luzanan, were defeated by the Muslim army led by Saladin, was possible only because of previous small-scale skirmishes in a variety of locations. Such small acts, Naji writes, include hitting a crusader with a stick on his head, a statement echoed by ISIS's spokesman Abu Muhammad al-Adnani in the wake of the airstrikes in Syria. Naji says that people think of Muslims at the time of the crusaders as one state, led by uh, Saladin al-Ayyubi and Nuruddin Zinki, but, quote, the fact is they were small families controlling citadels and fighting jihad against crusaders on a low level in a hard-hitting way. What Zinki and Ayubi did was to bring together those small blocks into one big organization, but the largest role was played by those small blocks. According to ISIS, violence has to be steady and escalatory to continue to shock and deter. Random acts of violence are not enough in this context. Brutality has to be ever more savage, creative, and shocking. So if the immolation of the pilot is more savage than previous murders, ISIS will undoubtedly be searching for an even more savage method to carry out its violent punishments. It is important to emphasize that ISIS increases the level of its savagery at critical moments rather than ad hoc. So this was published in 2015. So sometime after, Al-Hakim, who they're claiming this guy is, actually cautioned against the use of these things on the grounds of uh, popular perception. Something, something's not clicking for me. Because this is like... Stresses the need to consider public opinion in planning operations, discouraging beheadings. Like, that's odd. That's odd to me. I'm trying to think of, um, and I do wonder though, because this is in 2005, so it might have been with the experience of the Second Intifada that suddenly he's like, oh, actually, um, guys, like these, uh, these, uh, these suicide bombings and these acts of terrorism, they're, uh, they're losing a lot of hard-won support for the plight of colonized Arabs um, in the case of Palestine. Um, and that's, of course, bleeding out elsewhere also. That's kind of where my mind goes. Let Grammar Kami come on? Does Grammar Kami want to come on? Uh, yeah, she can come on. It's fine. I had a very bad time. I had all my sources up, and then I needed to close a bunch of things, which had my sources. That's fine. Um, we're not going to be talking for super long anyways. Uh, what did you want to say? Uh, so when he says the imaginary halo, I think he's drawing from Mao's concept of the quote-unquote paper tiger. Mao used it as an argument that uh, American imperialism wasn't as strong as it looked. It Basically, they have nukes, but they're not going to use them. It's a bluff. Um, well, yeah, but the, the, of... thing, the problem, though, is that he distinguishes between the, uh, the media power and the, the perception of military strength, right? Like these aren't, these aren't self-same in this account. Okay, then I might have misunderstood that. Maybe. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is he seems to be going off some stuff that I know of that was... Because it, it seems like when he's talking, just to, just to follow on that very quickly, it seems like when he's talking about the media halo, he's talking about 
the perception of the justness of American hegemony abroad. He's not talking about um, the perception of its power. Okay. Um, then, I, then I definitely misunderstood then. I haven't gotten around to reading this. No, it's yet. okay. Um, the other thing was the... Um, the way he's framing America seems very uh, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Um, th there was another book that I had and I had to close uh, by another Islamist um, that seems to say similar things about America, although that guy's more focused on the local... Uh, the local situation at the time during the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the formation of the state of Israel. Well, I, I think I think the reason for that that approach is because, um, like the the resistance against the Soviet Union is kind of a mythic quality for these people because it was a successful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. So that's 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 kind of that's that's what I take from it. I mean, yeah, like it's it's a very it's a very weirdly Cold War approach, given that it was published in two thousand four. But um, yeah, I mean, it it just seems like um, he's reading a lot of uh, he's he's reading a lot of really mid brow geopolitical analysts. Um, he mentioned Paul yeah, it, I wouldn't be surprised if he's if he's like just. If he's just working from like a, a textbook on international relations or something, because it's the kind of it's the kind of shit you'd see in like like oh, someone who's read Mearsheimer or somebody, right? Yeah, it seems like he's 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 trying to do a syncretic approach with those and some local texts and some stuff from uh, notable insurgent authors like Mao, basically. Um, I don't vouch for the quality of the, any of these. I'm sorry. Uh, any of what? What are you, what are you saying? Uh, but when I'm when I'm trying to clarify this, I I'm not trying to defend this. This doesn't seem very highbrow at all. Oh no no I I, I got gotcha. you. Um, I am going to get back to it. Uh, but thanks for coming on. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, bye. Take care. So yeah, so I think we get the I think we get the gist. Um, it's uh eh. I mean, like, it, it's, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say the primary value of this um, is that it provides a, it provides some level of, of at least the perception of uniformity of, of purpose and strategy between different members of ISIS. So that in itself has like a, a morale boosting quality, but it, it seems like bluntly terrible. Like that's that's kind of where that's kind of where I'm left with this, like just genuinely terrible, terrible political science. Um. So we'll finish this first topic section. First topic: definition of the management of savagery and an overview of its historical precedents. We said above that if one contemplates the previous centuries, even until the middle of the 20th century, one finds that when the large states or empires fell, whether they were Islamic or non-Islamic. And a state did not come into being, which was equal in power or comparable to the previous state and its ability to control the lands and regions of that state which collapsed. The regions and sectors of the state became, according to human nature, subservient to what is called administrations of savagery. Therefore, the management of savagery is defined very succinctly as the management of savage chaos. Okay. As for a detailed definition, it differs according to the goals and nature of the individuals in the administration. If we picture its initial form, we find that it consists of the management of people's needs with regard to the provision of food and medical treatment, preservation of security and justice among the people who live in the regions of savagery, securing the borders, which is spelled with an A for some reason, by means of groups that deter anyone who tries to assault the regions of savagery, as well as setting up defensive fortifications. This, by the way, is making me think this is a very sloppy translation. Because there are spelling errors here. Um, the stage of managing the people's needs with regard to food and medical treatment may advance to the stage of being responsible for offering services like education and so forth, and in the preservation of security and securing the borders may advance to working to expand of the region of savagery. So basically, the general idea here is that in a situation in which state power is crumbling, um, ISIS 
or not ISIS, but uh, the the jihadist movement, whatever it is, moves in, starts to fulfill basic functions, and then as a consequence of this, starts to become in the eyes of the people who engage with it and who see it as like the thing to look to for leadership and government, etc. And resistance against international forces. Why do we call it the management of savagery or management of savage chaos and not the management of chaos? That is because it is not the management of a commercial company or of an institution suffering from chaos or of a group of neighbors in a district or residential region, or even of a peaceful society suffering from chaos. Rather, it is more nebulous than chaos in view of its corresponding historical precedents and the modern world and in light of wealth, greed, various forces, and human nature, and its form which we will discuss in this study. Before its submission to the administration, the region of savagery will be in a situation resembling the situation of Afghanistan before the control of the Taliban, a region submitting to the law of the jungle in its primitive form, whose good people and even the wise among the evildoers yearn for someone to manage this savagery. They even accept any organization regardless of whether it is made up of good or evil people. However, if the evil people manage the savagery, it is possible that this region will become even more barbarous. And then he just lists the things that management of savagery entails. Um, so we want to clarify the requirements of the management of savagery in the ideal form we desire, in which agree with the aims of the Sharia. These requirements are spreading internal security, providing food and medical treatment, securing the region of savagery from the invasions of enemies, establishing Sharia justice among the people who live in the regions of savagery, raising the level of belief and combat efficiency during the training of the youth of the regions of savagery, and establishing a fighting society at all levels and among all individuals by making them aware of its importance. Spreading Sharia um, and worldly science. Dissemination of spies and seeking to complete the construction of a minimal intelligence agency. Uniting the hearts of the world's people by means of money and uniting the world through Sharia governance. Deterring the hypocrites with proof and other means and forcing them to repress and conceal their hypocrisy, to hide their discouraged opinions, and to comply with those in authority until their evil is put into check. Progressing until it is possible to expand and attack the enemies in order to repel them, plunder their money, and place them in a constant state of apprehension and make them desire reconciliation. Establishing coalition with those whom coalitions are, with whom coalitions are permitted, those who have not given complete allegiance to the administration. I mean, this is just kind of silly. I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is, um... Like, it's just, it's not novel. It's, it's very, it's very historically questionable. Um, and it's very naive. And I'm not, I'm not a fan. It's an interesting digression, though. Like, it's interesting to see, like, um... Because apparently, according to the, the article we just read, this is actually a text that is widely read. Now, granted, that's of 2015, so God knows like what the situation is now. 